we're really excited that you are joining us to pilot a whole new vision of how you could possibly do a residential outdoor ed. So we're, um, we're here because we're looking at the possibility of helping you all um, integrate residential outdoor ed into your curriculum in a way that is solutionary focused. So in a way where you do something before you go to residential outdoor ed that kind of sets a foundation for your students to understand sort of the fundamentals and the problems that will be explored. Then you're going to go to residential outdoor ed and have the amazing fun that you have while you're there. And then we're going to do something afterwards that has kids think about how to take that experience of residential outdoor ed and infuse it more into the school. Well, this is also partially informed by uh, the naturalists who mm -hmm. were um, at outdoor ed last year. So we had a, a full day of professional development with them where they informed us of like what they would like to see uh, happen before outdoor ed in terms of content mm -hmm. or just like general kind of like how kids should be thinking before they come to outdoor ed. So we took all of their uh, and all that information and worked with that to kind of massage it into everything that we've created. Okay. So why don't we just go ahead and, yep. and jump in. Um, if you have a device, now would be the time to open it up. Go ahead and go to our website. So the website was created specifically for this SMO, like SMO curriculum. So what Andrew and I are going to do today is basically walk you through all of the 10 lessons. So there are five lessons that come before the student's outdoor experience and five lessons that come after. Um, we are using a project-based learning framework that um, we, have, we have our own spin on at the county office. We call it our solutionary project-based learning framework. You'll see a link right here, our solutionary project-based learning. So if you, if you don't have to do it now, but if you want to learn more, that's like, it's like a two-minute animation about like what, what is, who is a solutionary? What does it need to be that? Just click on that. Um, during the very first phase, the fundamentals, this is where kids kind of get some baseline content knowledge. So that they, when they get to the next phase, which is the problem cycle, they can see where things are different than where they are, where the baseline is. Like they see anomalies that way, they see problems, right? And we help them point out like, well, it's, this is the way things are, but why is it like this? And why is this happening, right? And then from those problem cycles, and there could be multiple problem cycles, students would choose one of the problems and design a solution for that problem. And then in the end, they would uh, reflect on that entire experience. In multiple places, you could see, you could access the lessons. Right here, on this part here, you can access the lessons like that. They're the fund we group the fundamentals and problems together. Another way you can get to that is on the side, in the menu bar on the side. There's the three links there as well. But another way you can get to that is by like clicking on the titles. And here you also see it kind of spelled out, like what exactly takes place in each one. So this is kind of like an out of the can kind of experience. If you want to just say, I'm going to do this exactly the way that it was designed, feel free to. It's all there. But something that we want to encourage also is there being flexibility built into it. If there's something you're like, no, I don't want to show that video, or I think there really needs to be more here, or I think there's not enough time for this piece. It's yours, right? You can take out what you want, you can add what you want. Okay, so you can see every lesson plan is going to be basically the same. There's going to be an overview. There are going to be learning objectives for that lesson. Um, many times, but not always, you'll see how the content standards are aligned to that lesson. In this case, um, there are um, NGSS standards or performance expectations, there are some math standards, um, social studies, we scroll down a little bit more, there is a box there, it says equipment, instructional re resources and materials, as you can see there, <laughs> there's a link to the slide deck, and then the lesson itself. So anyway, let me just show you, the. so this is lesson one, this is um, about humanity's impact on Earth's four spheres. So we are in theory, one week before the students go to outdoor ed. So many of you might have seen this image before. Students might never have seen this particular image before, taken in 1968 um, by Bill Anders. Um, obviously, he's an astronaut, because he's literally taking this in mm -hmm. space. Um, this photo is called Earthrise, and um, he was actually po positioned the other way, taking pictures of the moon. And then NASA said, hey, can you do this? Can you turn around? And take, take a picture behind you. 
take a picture of the Earth. So he turned around, he took a picture of the Earth. That is the very first image ever taken of the whole Earth. It's the first time that humans ever saw the whole planet at the same time. So it's a very, very powerful uh, photograph that was taken. Uh, what exactly are we looking at here, right? So what features of the Earth can you see from space? What, what exactly are you looking at? Point, point out, as, as this Earth is rotating, just shout out, what do you see? Clouds. Clouds. Land. Yeah. Water. Plants. Green. So we have clouds, land, ocean, plants, green. Anything else? Non-green. And, and non-green <laughs> land. We have green land and non-green land. Yeah. Okay, great. You, you not, there it is. You saw, you just and white land. Green. Oh, yes. And you see at the bottom, you see some white land at the bottom as well. Great. So what we're actually seeing here are the, the four spheres that compose the Earth. So the clouds are in the atmosphere, right? So that's one of the spheres, right? That's where the air exists. The oceans, sometimes you'll see lakes and rivers. That's part of the hydrosphere. Um, the green parts that you're seeing there on the land, that is where we can see living things from far away. You can still see life. Uh, that's the biosphere. And then you saw land of all different kinds, ice-covered, snow-covered land, uh, the land that the green, the biosphere was on, um, the, the brown land, right, that's the geosphere. So these four spheres are actually what you're looking at. And the geosphere is all the layers of the Earth, right? And the biosphere is not reserved to one place. In fact, the biosphere pervades all the other three spheres. There's life in the atmosphere, life in the hydrosphere, life in the geosphere, right? So this is the first thing that we want kids to know, is that that's how we define the, the Earth, as having these four spheres. So here's another image. So take a look at this, right? You see like the different spheres are kind of broken up into four different images. There's a little definition there. This is an opportunity to do vocabulary with your students. Yeah. Um, see those arrows? Yeah. What, what, are those, what, what do you think those arrows mean? If you could be specific, like point out an arrow between two of the spheres, and how do you think that those arrows are relevant there? What do they mean? Um, some of the biosphere live in the geosphere, so in your soil you have all sorts of fungus, bacteria, worms, isopods, Absolutely, whatever. absolutely. So you can see that, right? There's living things in the geosphere, there's living things in the hydrosphere, there's living things in the atmosphere, yeah. right? Um, and you can also see them as impact. Every sphere in some way impacts another sphere. The hydrosphere impacts the geosphere by creating erosion, right? Like water hitting the, the cliff side and, and eroding the rocks that are there, right? The biosphere certainly has an impact on all the other three. We are part of the biosphere, and we are impacting every single one of these spheres. That's kind of what we want kids to get out of this. We want also kids to get out of this that um, these spheres were all living in pretty good balance for billions of years. Everything seemed to be fine. Of course, every once in a while, there would be some mass extinction, right? And things would get, you know, just go, go like haywire for millions and millions of years, and then things would settle, and there would, the Earth would look different at that point for whatever, however it looked, depending on, depending on the, uh, the mass extinction event. But things seemed to live in balance until our species showed up. And not even when they showed up originally. You know, we were around for several hundred thousand years before we started to have a significant severe impact on, the, on all four of these spheres, right? So that's another thing we want kids to get out of this. Things were in, in balance for billions of years, and then recent, in recent history, things have started to be, go out of balance because of human impact. This is definitely the kind of time that you'd want to do some kind of trauma-informed practice. We don't want kids to feel guilty that we are part of the species that is, as that is throwing off the planet, but at the same time, we want kids to be aware that there are things that we're doing that we could change, and they could change behaviors. And that's what this unit is about. It's about possibly students having an impact on changing behaviors of others at their school, 
And we're going to do that at the very end. What can, we, what can kids do about this? How can we bring a little bit more balance to our world? Here's, here's back to this. Here's a question that I, already, uh, that I sort of asked you before. In what ways do all living things, or the biosphere, rely on the other spheres to survive? And I ask you that question. How do living things rely on the other spheres to survive? Soil or water to grow my food. Great. Yeah. So soil, as part of the geosphere, has the substrate for plants to grow. So here's one example, right, of a, a decaying uh, tree trunk. So you know, and then you can see the decomposing mushrooms all over it, and the plants, um, the moss that's growing on it, right. So we're like these organisms, like mushrooms and moss, are are, rel are relying on this on this tree, on this decaying tree. They're getting water from the soil. They're getting nutrients from the soil. The plants are getting um, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, right? You could use this as an example. You can use any, lots and lots of examples for this. I just pulled up this one. Feel free to ask kids to provide their own examples. Feel free to provide your own examples. Here's just one example of the interaction of the four spheres in a single event. Again, trying to get kids to think about, we are part of the biosphere. We rely on nature to survive. And kids will talk about this for a while, I'm sure. Yeah, see? So, like humans, like all living things, we need these resources that are provided by nature for us not just to survive, but to thrive in the time that we're alive. And not just for, like, basic needs kind of thing. We need plants and animals and all the bios and all the, the, uh, the different spheres for lots of different things. You could see here, for energy, yeah. right? right? Whether it's from fossil fuels, which is how a majority of our energy, not here in San Mateo County, but a, a majority of the planet gets their energy from fossil fuels, to solar energy, to wind energy. These are all things that are found in the other spheres. And again, we're trying to instill this sense of connection to nature. So we have to remind kids that Nature is where biodiversity is. Like all the living things in the world live in the biosphere, in nature. That's where we get our food. That's how we build our homes. That's where we get our medicines from. Awesome. Great. So we're going to make a little transition here to go from just like the basic fundamentals of this to a little bit like introducing problems. So as we do that, I just want to give you a quick chance to turn and talk. How do you normally do a little bit of fundamentals before you send kids to residential outdoor ed? Or how are you thinking about doing that to set them up for a week of like talking about stewardship of the planet, right? So go ahead and just have a quick conversation and then, then we'll get into more of the problems. I don't think I did that very good job. I just kind of like sprung up on you, right? So I'm excited to be here. And they're feeling that. All right, if you can hear my voice, pop one. Okay, I'm not even going to take it any further because it's small enough. Um, but I just wanted to give you a chance to think about that. Like, what do you already do? And, and just as a reminder that these are just suggestions. So if you already have something great that you do that kind of sets up, like, here's the fundamentals of, like, the planet, um, do that, right? But if you don't already have something like that, then here, this is here for you. So as Theron laid out, um, for the most part, we've had a lot of stability in these four spheres. Um, or we've had instability, right? But it was caused by natural things. Mm. Now we've got this instability happening largely because one species is having this enormous impact on the planet. So we're going to talk about a couple different things there. Um, I, I like to frame this. Um, I've been doing a lot of trainings in the last couple of years of really understanding that, uh, th that not all humans are doing this, right? In fact, so many humans have been living for thousands of years on this planet without throwing things off into an imbalance. Mm -hmm. So when I use this language, I'll use it a lot. I'll say like non-indigenous humans, right? And so that's something that like now I'm introducing a topic. I don't know what kind of history you've done with your students or how much you've explored like Native American cultures or indigenous cultures. So you can take that or leave it, right? You can decide what feels right for your community. But I, I want to make sure that I acknowledge that this is not something that all humans are doing. This is something that is a very recent phenomenon by humans that are living in a non-indigenous lifestyle, right? So and we're doing this in a way that's pretty imbalanced. And we're reaching a crisis point largely because our population is growing. So we're just going to show a couple quick pictures here. Like, right, our population is growing. It's growing really fast. We're hitting 8 billion. Yeah, that's what that link Very is there. Soon, right? so I would ask kids, how many, how many people do you think there are in the world right now? And if you click on the world counts, 
They were super close, super close to eight wow. million, right? So that that's a lot. And some kids, it might 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 be more useful to see that like over time to understand that this is very very recent that humans have like jumped in the billions <laughs> with our human population, right? So this is ten thousand BCE over here. And we're just trucking along, just living in balance, living in balance, and then we start to really creep up, and then our species just like skyrockets, right? You can talk to them about like what are some of the things that contributed to that based on where you're at in social studies, right? So they might be like, oh, we've already studied the Industrial Revolution, so we know that that's happening, or whatever, right? So there might be things that kids can share here about human population growth. This is also an opportunity for you to do math. You don't have to give them this graph. You can give them the data points. They can create the graph themselves. Or you could just ask them, where do you see significant events or significant um, information taking place here? So they can point out, oh, I could see right here, uh, for the first time, we reached a billion people, right around here, which is around 1805. It's in the, in the lesson plan. And you can have them calculate how much time has, goes by in between mm. adding a billion people. And you'll, you'll see this in the lesson plan, too. It starts off like... 120, first of all, it started off with like all of human history to get to a billion, then 123 years to get to a 2 billion, and then to, it just keeps going down, and now we're like, every, you can see that at the equidistance, like every 12 years, we add a billion, and we're going to be at the 8 billion mark by the end of this year, um, and then you can have them calculate out, like when are we going to reach 10 billion based on current projections, right? Uh, anyway, so this is a great opportunity to do some very meaningful math with them. And basically, the whole reason to introduce this is to re introduce the idea of carrying capacity mm -hmm. and recognizing that when any species gets a little bit out of control with their population, right, like they, they, they can't live forever like that. It's unsustainable, right? And so it's, an, it's a chance to introduce that idea. Um, and we're going to play a little game right now that is going to be about feeling what that feels like. But we're going to play a game. It's called Environmental Musical Chairs. Um, and the rules are stay in the room. You have to move when the music starts for the game, and then no running, screaming, or pushing, okay? <laughs> and um, the idea of the game is that we're going to have to sit when the music stops, and you can sit on the floor, you can sit on stools if they're available, um, but once a surface has been taken, and it will be taken if somebody places like a piece of paper on it or a piece of cardboard, you can't sit there, okay? So that's how the game is played. You all ready to do it? Yes. Yeah. right now is it comfortable enough to have a seat yeah, yeah? all right we're gonna play another round here we go <laughs> to answer some questions. And you can think about these questions. I'll say them out loud in case you can't see. So the first question is, what happened? The second question is, how did it feel to play? And the third question is, what would happen if we played longer? So just pair up with somebody near you, if you can, and, and talk about those things. So somebody could just really quickly share with us what observation level, what happened during the game? Things got more and more cluttered. Yeah, things got more cluttered because the room filled with what? Paper. Paper, right? So you could just do that kind of basics. Now, how did it feel as the room got more and more cluttered with paper and there became less and less space to sit? Stressful. Stressful. Uh huh. Any other thoughts? Chaotic. Okay. Chaotic, stressful, mm -hmm. yeah. What would happen if we played longer? If I was like round four, <laughs> round five, round six, what would happen? God, we would. Be all in like little islands. <laughs> yeah, right. If we're lucky, we'd run out of space, yeah. right? Is there a way to win this game? 
only if we stop throwing paper on the ground. If we stop throwing paper, right? But I have to throw the paper because I started the music and the music told me like I gotta you gotta throw paper on the ground. Can you reuse the paper that's already on the paper? No, 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 no. <laughs> the rules are that we can't touch the paper. Yeah. So is there any way to win? What's the Not thing with that set of rules? Not without a different set of rules, right? Not without a different set of rules or just not turning on the music, right? So it's really what it takes is a paradigm shift. So having a student say like a different set of rules, that means a paradigm shift. Or having somebody say you have to turn off the music, that's a paradigm shift, right? So that's, we're kind of setting the foundation for like, we have to change the way we even think about this. Just give a, give a chance for people to just shout out. What do you think the, the environmental issues are that you can see or feel with this game? Pollution. Pollution, great. Yeah, what else? Overuse of resources. Yep, natural resource depletion. Any other ideas? Overpopulation. Overpopulation. I always add built landscape. That's one thing that I think most people don't think about, most kids certainly don't think about, but roads, houses, like all the things that are human that we have, right? Can I, can yeah, I ask you sure. one more thing? Um, Another thing I think would be really neat to do would be to get everybody in the middle of playing this game and say, okay, take them outside to like grass and have them debrief how did that feel mm -hmm. and experience the grass under their feet and the sky above their head and say, well, how did that feel in that little space in amongst all those papers? And then have them go right back to their spot yeah. in amongst the papers. I like because, that. Because, you know, I, a lot of these kids come from a walled-in space mm -hmm. yeah. where all their nature is you know, controlled by humans, and then they come to school by car, mm -hmm. and then their parents don't want them to get their shoes dirty, so then they come to the classroom. And so actually, they may not see it, be as freaked out as we are. Yeah, yeah. Some of them. They might not be. They this. might be used to it, right? And that's yeah. a really good point, right? So it, this, this game is really about giving everybody a shared experience, knowing that everybody has a different experience, right? So mm -hmm. it's giving them that shared experience, and it's giving them that shared mindset of like, now reimagine that these papers are pollution. Now reimagine that these papers are building, right? And, and so just letting them understand, okay, this is what it looks like, and having them experience that kind of crisis in, in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Then you want to do some softer things with them. You want to you know, give them some space to do some processing about like where they see this in their life, right? So making those connections. Where do you see this locally, globally? How much are you impacted by these issues? Giving them a chance to do some of that debriefing. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to just show you one more thing. Um, then you can start to introduce the idea of ecological overshoot. You can choose to do what I'm doing where you're making people just sit there in it for a while. Or you can say, you know what, before we go into some of these vocabulary debriefs and really thinking about this, let's clean it up, right? And so I'm going to ask us to do that now just so we can get a little bit more comfortable. Mm -hmm. As you're cleaning it up, I want you to think about what does it feel like to clean up human impact, right? Like how does it feel to do it? How long does it take? How seriously is it? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, you can only adapt so much, right? At some point, adaptation becomes extinction. Yeah, I know. I don't want to like pay them and like, you know, overlap the I love to give kids time to talk about that. How did it feel to clean it up, right? You can have them then talk to their partner about it. But I'm going to move us forward a little bit um, into just the basic concepts that you can now, like, really put some vocabulary to our ecological overshoot. So talking about the fact of that idea that if we're doing all these things, at some point we're demanding more from the Earth's four spheres, then the four spheres can regenerate, right? And so we're out of balance then, if that's happening. And they, they'll, they'll be like, oh, we saw it. We saw the out of balance, right? Like, they'll, they'll get it right away. Um, so you could go a little further if you want an ecological footprint. You can really, like, take that apart and explain, like, what are the things that we are calculating with an ecological footprint? Um, you can, if you want, you can go even further and you can talk about like how many planets, if we lived exactly the way we're living today, how many planets would we need in order to sustain ourselves. <coughs> so you can take them through some of this ecological footprinting concepts if you want, but I've also not done that and it's still a good exercise, right? It's still good just to give them that like pollution, built landscape. If you want to go further and you want to like really go into ecological overshoot, you can really take that a lot further. Um, and you can even have uh, you can even have them do some ecological footprint calculations, which are in the extension slides of that lesson. But I do think the most important thing that you want to do is to to give them a chance to talk about their feelings, right? So give them a chance to debrief, like what feelings came up for you when we talked about human impact and ecological overshoot. What feelings came up for you as we played this game? And then ask them, you know, give them a chance to explore their feelings and then, and then give them that opportunity to say, like, aside from us here, who else could you talk to about this? 
right? Because some kids are going to go home and they're going to have deeper feelings as they're home, right? Especially if they're driving past a lot of pollution and homelessness and other things on their way home. They're going to have deep feelings and they're going to have felt the crisis, right? So that's important to give them that, that opportunity to, to go further. And you can tell them that, like, by the end of all this, after residential outdoor ed, we're going to figure out how to solve this problem, right? So you're not leaving them in this, like, doom and gloom space. Um, and then, like I said, there's a ton of different um, extension options. So for literacy, if you want to do reading the Lorax, that game is literally the Lorax, right? It's like the whole book, just like in a, in a simulation. Um, and there's a lot of other books out on the table, and there's a, a book list here that you can draw from. Um, there's also research activities that you could do, like having them calculate their own uh, ecological footprint, looking at ecological footprints of countries, um, and there's more, there's more research stuff and there's more videos as well. So there's a ton of stuff there for the slide deck if you want to go a little bit further. Wow. Okay. So that's lesson one. That's hefty. Um, we're going to transition to lessons two through four, but um, I'll give us just like a few minutes to turn and talk with the people at your table, like what from that could you see yourself doing um, really effectively with your students. Okay, so, um, all right, so hopefully you're feeling like you could see yourself doing that, you could see yourself bringing some of that to your kids. You now introduce problem to them, right? And so now they're going to have to do some investigation of that problem. And I like to keep this, um, whenever I do this type of stuff, I like to keep it focused on the school so that you're not going into them looking at it at their homes. You can do that with their homes, but just recognizing that in every kid's context, like, home may not be so easy, right? And we have foster youth in our county, we have homeless youth in our county, so if you focus it on school, it's neutral, and, it, and hey, your schools are all problematic, none of them are doing this well, right? Mm -hmm. So might as well focus on the school as the problem. Um, so this next segment is actually lessons two, three, and four. What the purpose of this is, is for kids to actually explore how are, how are we using resources at school? Like, what is the ecological footprint of what we're doing at school? Um, and the reason that we're introducing that here is because they're going to go to residential outdoor ed, where we do talk a lot about that at residential outdoor ed, and we talk about, like, doing things a little differently than we do at home, like with our food waste and, and, you, and doing resource conservation. And so we want them to be introduced to, like, to what extent do we do resource conservation already at school before we go to this other place where we talk about it a lot, right? So lesson two, like I said, is an introduction to this idea of like, okay, we introduced this big global problem, now we're going to look at it locally. And you'll, you'll take kids through thinking about, okay, your school building and your campus, and you know, you may never have thought about this, but we've got all these systems at our school that we use resources for. And just introducing them to that idea of like, we're going to look at energy, we're going to look at water, waste, and land ecosystems. Now, a lot of kids um, may not even know the word efficiency or conservation, so it's good to spend a little time like explaining what that word means, because what they're going to do is they're going to go look for inefficiencies on the school campus, right? So you want to introduce the idea of like the things that we're looking for are like unsealed windows and lights on when no one's inside, or we're looking for leaky faucets. And in some cases, we're just going to count like how many light bulbs do we have, how many waste bins do we have. Just getting them to, to make the system visible is basically the idea of an audit so that they can really start to see what they normally just walk right past, right? What we all normally just walk right past. So that's the idea of it is to like make that like more visible for them. And in doing so, looking for problems as they make it visible, right? So it might help to have kids, be, knowing that they're going to do this field research, they're going to go do these audits. It might also help to give them a little bit of time to just explore the topics. So we set this up so if you want to have your kids conduct some research just on like what is energy, what is water, what is waste, they can actually click on a web quest and explore that. So I'm just going to click on one to show you what, what's in it. So this water web quest, um, the way it's set up, and the way that I think all web quests work is kids don't have to go through every single resource. So it's not like a hyperdoc where they have to go through a resource and like put information in. A web quest is just like explore wherever you want. So this is set up to say like section one is all about water being a finite resource. So if kids like are like, I don't know much about how much fresh water we have or like the water cycle even, they can explore in that kind of like basic world. Um, and then if they want to get more into the other problems, they can be like, well, I want to look at water pollution, right? Water contamination. 
or I want to look at like what's happening with climate change and water. So this is a nice, um, a nice resource that lets kids at whatever level they're at kind of go to where they need to go as opposed to like everybody going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. But then lesson three is doing the audit. Okay, so we're going to jump to that and we're going to actually experience a little bit. So um, I'm gonna, we'll pass these out. We're going to pass out a packet of all the different audits just so you can flip through them and understand what kind of things the kids are going to go out and do when they do an on-campus field trip. I just wanted to remind you, like, some of this, you might think, like, oh, that's too much for our building. That would be impossible, so on and so forth. So be mindful of that as you're looking through the water. Like, all four audits are stapled together, right? So as you're looking through it, think about your own campus. Think about your own classroom. And, like, what can be done? What do you think is going to be very difficult to be done? And just, you know, you, can, you have it in your head. You can cross it out. You can make some notes for yourself. Everything is a Google Doc, so you can just make a copy and adapt it to how you want it. Okay. A lot of times what I have the kids do with a web class is I'll say, like, um, write down five things that, uh, five facts, write down three things that surprised you, and write down, like, two questions mm -hmm. or something, so mm -hmm. that it's, like, pretty simple, and then I'll give them time to, like, discuss that. Yeah. And then you can say, for this preparation part, yeah. you can say, like, go back to what you learned in your web class and see if you can, like, answer some of that preparation okay. part. Yeah. That's good. I think it's... And I'll, I'll say this as well. We made the suggestion that you put kids in groups. So there's four topics, and then within each audit, there's different sections. So if you if you break your kids into you know whatever, however many groups, and then have them do just a piece of each audit, that might work best. But in each audit, there's something called audit preparation. They should do that together as a group, right? So I'm going to just really quickly show us the, the energy one. So you'd have your, you tell your group to talk about what kind of things require energy at our school, right? And that's just like a brainstorm for them and they can fill in the spaces. So let's just do that really quick. What kind of things require energy? Here. Computer. Lights. Projectors. Lights. Projector. Computer. Computer. Sure. Yeah, you could say like appliances. Mm -hmm. Like you could throw all those things into yeah. the appliance category. So you can you can say like heat, you can say oh there's thermostats on the wall what are those thermostats for right and it's like heating and cooling now some kids might be pretty savvy and they'll be like oh well the the faucet over there has hot water and so we have to heat the water right and so that's a good one to just note that yeah that does take energy right and some other kid might be like oh we have to pump the water right and so you can say like yeah pumping the water like all that stuff takes energy so that's the energy like basic prep. Um, there is some content here that we actually even changed on the drive-in, like looking at it, um, it says like what utility company you use, like everybody in San Mateo County uses PG&E, so I just changed that and I wrote like everybody uses PG&E, and we all use Peninsula Clean Energy, so they don't need to go investigating too far on that. Um, something that you, is you flip the page to section one where it says lighting. So the reason it says to like count all the bulbs and get a sense of it is just so that they understand like the bigger footprint, right? Mm -hmm. So right now, if you were to take kids through this, you'd be like, count how many bulbs are in this room, right? So we can just all do that. There's about 10, right? Yeah. And now they might need to be like, I don't know, is it halogen, is it fluorescent, is it LED, right? And if they can't answer a question like that, you can just say, just note it, we need to ask the custodian, right? Um, and you can give them a chance to do that, or if you pre-do this yourself and you want to just like provide that answer for them, that's fine too. But you could say, go look at it, see if you can tell, right? And if they can't tell, then you say, note it as a question, because um, they're not going to always be able to. And then you give them a chance to count appliances around the room. So if you look around this room, like there is a ton of appliances, right? And they're not always in this room, because it's a maker space, there's some weird ones, right? <laughs> so they're going to have a lot to fill in in the other category. Um, but they would just total of these up. Now, it says over here, like, note the number of appliances with an Energy Star label. So I'm going to ask you to get up and see if you can find an Energy Star label on any of the appliances. Anybody find one yet? She found one. Oh, okay. So there's an Energy Star label over there. So that might be a chance to work with that group and say, like, okay, what does this mean? What's this label mean, right? And, like, walking them through Absolutely. it. That's an efficiency label. That's saying that that appliance is efficient. Again, this is all happening in a group. So you as a teacher are going to have like a group doing energy, another group doing water, another group doing waste. Mm -hmm. So it might be good to do this yourself in your own classroom first so you have some like idea of like what is going on in your own classroom. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're welcome to have the audit just stop at your classroom and then have the kids like count how many classrooms there are and just be like, okay, that's what our school has. Or if you have the time and your kids are like, 
uh, motivated. motivated and also quiet enough they could go do some of this around the rest of the school, right? So for the water one, you'll see that it asks kids, like, same kind of preparation, where do we get our water source? And our, our water is sourced very differently depending on the district you're in. So that is a, like, you're going to actually have to have them do some research and they'll have to ask a custodian or they'll have to look at a map. Um, but the next piece is about, like, the actual use. So the second page of the water audit asks them to, like, look at where water is being used. So we happen to have a sink in this classroom, right? So they could say, they could note that there's a sink in the classroom, but you'll probably have to have kids go like to the bathroom, right? And go into the bathroom and take a look. So let's go do it. <laughs> so before we go in here, um, I'm just gonna note that it says for the bathroom, it asks them to count the amount of toilets and urinals. So that's a good one. It's gonna ask things like, um, do they have a water saving feature? So it's, it says like only one person in the bathroom at a time. So I'll just take a couple of you in. But um, it's good for them to, to note when they flush it, like how it flushes. I had, this is just like an anecdotal story, but I was going for green business certification out of school I taught at, and all the, all the toilets said that they were low flush. And so when we were being audited by the city, they came in and the guy flushed it and he's like, that's not a low flush toilet. I was like, yeah, it is. It says it right on it. And he said, flush it. How long does it take to flush? It took 13 seconds to flush. He's like, a low flush toilet takes three seconds. Mm -hmm. So you could have your kids do something like that. Flush the toilet and count how many seconds it takes for the water to fill back up. If it takes longer than three, it's not a low flush toilet. And what I found out is that my facilities manager put all the old parts in to the toilets Ooh. because he was having so many clogs. And he was like, I, I know how to deal with this. We'll just go back to the old flushing system. But that of course was wasting a lot of water, right? So we just had to go and fix the pipes, the sewer pipes. And I would just say, like, don't worry if the kids it's not totally accurate and perfect, right? The idea is just that they're going and making the school visible. It's not like, oh, you were off in your toilet count by one toilet. It's okay, right? <laughs> like, no big deal. Um, but it's five toilets off. That's then now we're getting serious, right? Now they're just doing a terrible job. Um, so another thing is the waste part. So the school campus waste audit. Um, I definitely recommend in here. It, it asks the kids to go to all the different places. So not just the classroom, but also the cafeteria um, and also the outdoor spaces. So I'm going to just ask you really quickly. Do you see any signs of waste bins out here? A couple over there, right? Are you So they're unlabeled bins, it's totally not obvious. Um, and so that's stuff that you can ask your kids to do in this. Do you guys see any litter anywhere or is it pretty clean? Pretty clean, right? It's pretty clean, right? So you can ask, they're, they're gonna be asked to make those types of observations. So this was like lessons two, three, and then four is them putting it all together and sharing it with their classmates. So we have some tools available for them to, to share the analysis of it. You don't want them sharing every little detail. Those are gonna be the most boring presentations on earth, right? But you do want them to be like, the most interesting thing we found was that like, there's a 10 leaky faucets. Or the most interesting thing we found is like, you know, that all of our waste bins are, are, mis are like improperly labeled. So it gives them a chance to just like say, what was like the most interesting stuff? What's the big analysis to take away that your classmates should know about? Awesome, I do recommend before you teach this lesson that you do some of the audit yourself of just about as long as we took, like okay. gazing around at hoses and downspouts and water fountains so that you feel comfortable answering those questions as best as possible. And I also recommend you give a custodian a heads up that this yes. is happening, <laughs> yes. you know, um, especially if, if your custodians don't speak English very well, like making sure that there's somebody that could translate or something like that, just so that they get to share their knowledge still um, and that they are able to be a part of it. So we just finished up lessons one through four. I just wanted to pause and see, do people have any questions about one through four, specifically also about like the audits or the web quests or any comments, any clarifications? So, yeah, after the audit, I'm just, I'm seeing my students give a presentation to our class, but I also see my students giving a presentation at some point to our PTO. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Or yeah. even the school board mm -hmm. uh, yeah. when they have a, a larger purpose or a goal yeah. in mind for what they would like to see change. Yes. 
Um, I definitely like hold that thought because after we do the solutionary design challenge at the end of the day, like you'll you'll be able to think about like how would my kids put all this story together to now tell to the school board or to now tell to a PTA um, to talk about like the change that they want to see happen. Yeah, and and they'll and that's part of why we did this like evidence gathering is because I've definitely had kids go out there and do those presentations without the evidence, and it's very easy for adults to be like, well. You know, what can you like? Why do you think this problem exists? And if the kids don't have that backup evidence, and they're pretty easy to dismiss them. So if they have that evidence, though, then it's like a very robust presentation, and it and it really gets at the idea that like yeah, change is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. So definitely hold on to that. The presentation that we put in there for the kids, the little template, is it's a lot more basic. It's just like how does waste get generated? What type of waste do we create? Like similar for the other ones, like water and energy. And then it says things like, what are the inefficiencies? So it's a really like basic one, but they do have all that data in the actual audit, right? So they'll have data. So lesson five, basically this is like your bridge, right? From like, we were doing stuff in the classroom to like, we're about to go be in nature for five days. So we're trying to like help kind of do that little bridge and also do the bridge on the fundamentals and the problems as well. I do think it's worth like talking to your students about their comfort level in the outdoors. So you'll see here, and, I, and probably all of you probably do something like this, right? You're not just like taking the kids out to, to nature, but I put this here in case you haven't seen something like this. Like how often do you spend time outdoors? How comfortable do you feel outdoors? How much space do we have at school to be outdoors? Would you like more or less? So again, kind of giving your classmates a chance to just like say how they feel about it. And also your classmates a chance to hear each other talk about it, right? Because there are going to be some kids who are super into that experience and other kids are going to be like, I don't spend a lot of time outdoors at all. Mm -hmm. This book, um, Fatima's Great Outdoors, is about a family who's never been camping before and just their experience of that um, and what it's like. So if you have a lot of kids in your class who are like on the very mild side and are like, I don't spend a lot of time out there, might be good to read a book as a class just to like you know ground them in like this is where we're headed okay so the other part of this lesson that i think is important we kind of framed it a little bit earlier talking about indigenous um knowledge is to to let kids know that like where we're about to go at this residential outdoor ed place is um is grounded in ideas that come from indigenous knowledge and indigenous wisdom so bringing back that uh, like what there are humans already who live very in a way that's very connected to the planet. Um, and just giving them a chance to like think about that. So this segment is very quick if, if you feel like you, don't, um, you haven't done a lot with students, or you could really extend this with books and literature and go a lot further. Um, but basically, indigenous wisdom, what this boils down to, is a pretty strong understanding of systems and systems thinking and circular cause and effect. And if I do this to the planet, at some point, it's going to come right back and, and, and hit me, right? Most humans, so I always say like indigenous populations is 5% of the, of the world population. 95% of the world like doesn't usually think that way, right? 95% of the human population doesn't have like on their mind all the time that circular cause and effect. But at residential outdoor ed, when you go, like that's a big part of it, right? It's that constant like conservation, what we do to the planet comes back to us. And so laying a little foundation for that and giving your students some vocabulary and tools will be very helpful. So we're gonna go play one more game outside that, um, that really builds the, the vocabulary and tools of a systems thinker. Okay, so this game is called Equal Distance Triangles or Equal Distance Triangles. And the objective of the game is to have um, our group like eventually reach balance. And the way that the game is played is that you are going to pick um, two different numbers and you're going to remain equal distance between those two numbers. So for example, if I picked number, and if you guys could just hold your numbers up real quick, if I picked number three and number six, um, I would like need to be like right here to be in between number three and number six. So if I'm standing here, am I equal distance? No. No, no right? But if I'm standing all the way over here, am I equal distance? In a triangle, but not between, in a triangle, not between right? them. In a triangle. Yeah, right? Yeah, like, okay. yes. right? So um, you're going to pick two numbers. You're going to do it silently so nobody knows which two numbers you picked. And then when I say go, you're going to start the process of remaining equal distance between them. Okay? Any questions? You're not supposed to talk during the game. Okay? okay? 
So go ahead and pick your two numbers silently. Hold your hold the numbers up at your chest so that everyone can see them. Let's see which numbers are available. All right, go ahead and go. Uh oh. Were you following? I was following six and eight. Six and eight. Okay, six and eight. I think I had two number tens. That could have been a problem. Sorry. Um, <laughs> number, really? number seven. Are you dead? They both have number ten. Uh, four and ten. Four and ten. Yeah, I think that's why we have actually found something. Yeah. Four and ten. All right. So when you're looking at this, that's kind of crazy, right? Thinking yeah. about what was going on. Mm -hmm. So let's now make some observations. What we're what we're looking at right now is a system. And can anybody describe kind of like what what was happening with that system while we were playing? So we just looked at like who was following who, but what happened when we actually said play to that system? There's a lot of observing and you're shifting where you're the two marks that you're trying to get equal distance with. Mm -hmm. So a lot of observing and a lot of shifting. What mm -hmm. else did you observe? Yeah. I'm kind of stepping back for a second to kind of reassess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, is that not just for me too? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I definitely noticed that. So some of the things that we're talking about are basic features of a system. So in a system, the structure drives the behavior. So in this system, the structure was remain equal distance between two people, and it drove the behavior that many of you have described of like motion, right, mm -hmm. and movement, and, and like having things kind of like move about, right? Um, the system's parts all played a role, as you can see. So each of you are part of the system, and every single one of you played a role in that. And the system's parts are interdependent, right? If one part moved, everything else started to move. And some of you saw that kind of like delay at the very end. It was like mm -hmm. a little bit of shuffling. Like it never quite reached like complete static, right? Um, in this system, we noticed that some part, some uh, numbers had more leverage than others, right? So if more numbers were following mm -hmm. that number, mm -hmm. then it had more leverage on the system. So for example, um, Let's see, number six, a lot of people pick number six. If number six had just taken off running, right, what would have happened to our system? Oh my God, that would have been terrible. Right? I like that. All of a sudden it would have been like, oh, damn. Because that number had a lot of leverage over the system. That's funny. And again, I'm sorry about the double ten. That's not intentional at all. Um, I observed as somebody watching it that the system changed over time, right? We started in a perfect circle and then we kind of ended in like an awkward blob with like things in the middle. Um, and... That's because there's some delay in the system as we're moving, right? But that's also just because of the structure. The structure was equal distance triangles, right? So that kind of forced it to be in a certain way. Now, to some degree, systems have boundaries. Was there an actual boundary imposed on this game? The tables kind of limited the us. The tables, right? So it's just like where we played, kind mm -hmm. of. I noticed that. Like, I've played it in a larger grassy field, and the system usually gets bigger and bigger, yeah. as opposed to smaller and smaller. But it also teaches you about the idea that most systems have boundaries. Of course, our universe is a system, right? So if you really get into a debate with kids about whether or not the universe has boundaries, you can say, like, that's undetermined, right? Like, that's it. <laughs> but otherwise, most systems have some boundaries. So giving kids some of these, this language can be useful because we're talking about systems all the time, right? We talked about the planet as a system. We talked about how these four spheres are systems, right? Like, that's a good for them to get a little bit of this language. And you can bring it back to lesson one if you want. Like you could say like, what are some of the parts and variables of you know, the planet that we talked about? And like the parts would be like the, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, right? So you can start to bring some of that language back for them so that they can start to like have that. And you could say, what were some of the changes we talked about over time in our planetary system? And they would be like, oh, the population growth, right? Like that was a change over time. Um, and you can talk about some of the, um, that some parts have more leverage, right? Like right now the whole unit is designed around this idea that humans are having too much impact on the planet. So we have too much leverage right now. Um, and so all of that will help them kind of have some vocabulary for what we've been talking about. So I'm going to give you one other activity, which is um, these habits of a system thinker cards. But this takes it just a little bit further with your students to think about what are some of the habits that a system thinker uses when they think about the world. 
So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to just sift through these with the people at your table and talk about the habits that you feel like you use pretty regularly and then the habits that you feel like you could strengthen um, as to, to strengthen your system thinking skills. Okay, so I'm going to just pause you for a second um, and say, like, you don't necessarily, like, I'm just showing you this. You don't have to do this with your kids, and you could just show them a couple of these, right? Um, but the idea is just to expose them to that vocabulary and that, like, that understanding of, like, there's a whole way of thinking, and it has, like, patterns of, of how you think. I personally, and Allison, you can, you can tell me what you think about this. I think, like, at Outdoor Ed, the systems thinking that they do the most there definitely seeks to understand big picture. I think there's a lot of circular cause and effect, right? Like, I think that that's explored really big there. Um, I think short-term and long-term unintended consequences of actions comes up, you know? Um, I definitely feel like recognizing that a system structure generates its behavior. So there's a lot of talk about like, you know, we designed the, the cob house a certain way, we've got this garden, like we've got these rain barrels, there's solar panels, like there's a lot of that there. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say the whole week is about changing perspective to increase our understanding, yeah. right? What we just did was the academic understanding of systems. What we're going to do now is more of that like, when they use the word spiritual, like more of that like connection, but like feeling connection um, with, with nature. So um, this is an opportunity for kids to like, okay, we just got some tools, we've been talking about this a lot, but now I want you to like go out and actually like put feelings to what we're talking about. So we're going to give you a chance to just walk around outside and make some observations as you're walking about nature, about some of these systems ideas if you want. Um, and then really be thinking about like as you do it, what's your relationship with nature? So how connected do you feel to nature or disconnected do you feel to nature? Um, you can think about how easy or hard it is for you to get access to nature in your own life. Like is it easy? Is it hard? Think about it in your school life as well as your classroom like situated by nature. Is it really hard to get to it? Um, what type of activities do you do with families and, and friends outside in nature or not? Um, and then you can also think about what observations do you make during the walk that have to do with these new systems ideas. And you're welcome to like head out behind this area if you want, go into the field. Um, but at the end of it, if you can pick one little tiny piece of nature, like a twig, rock, bark, leaf, whatever it is, without hurting nature, um, bring one thing back and we're just going to talk about how that's, that thing is a symbol of your relationship to nature. Okay? So... You all feel comfortable doing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so go for it, make it about five minutes, come on back after that and we'll have a discussion. some of that indigenous wisdom that we've also been exposed to, look at your little pieces of nature and think about how are they connected to each other, how are they connected to the four spheres, how are they connected to you, and just have a little dialogue about that, about the different pieces you, you each picked and what some of those connections are. Okay. The structure determines the flowering Okay. So, that, I think, is a good way to end lesson five because it's, as it actually brings them back to lesson one, yeah. right? So this is your check for understanding moment. Like, did you get it? Can you apply some of what we've been talking about, right? So that's why I put that in there is to have that kind of moment. I would probably do something like this. Like, I would probably actually, like, sit in a circle even and, like, have as many kids as possible to share. Um, like, just trying to make sure that you've really checked their understanding and that they're able to use, like, they were able to say something about the four spheres, so they're able to say something about systems, right? So that you're making sure that all your kids are going to walk out of that with some understanding. Does that make sense to folks? And you mm -hmm. might, there's a, a lot of other ways that you might do it, but those are just some of the thoughts I had as we put that last little piece into this, is like we needed a check for understanding moment. You might also have kids do a write on it, like a journal write. You might also have kids do a diagram even to show that they understood like, oh, here are some of the connections that we're making, right? Like that could be really fun. So totally up to you. This was just like a, a quicker discussion version of like getting the check for understanding. 
Okay, so the last uh, the last thought that we have here then is um, would be like, okay, now we're going to outdoor ed. Right? <laughs> now it's time for outdoor ed. So we're gonna have you at lunchtime. We're gonna it's gonna be about 35 minutes for lunch. We're gonna ask you to spend at least like the first 10 or so minutes of it structured with um, discussing in table groups outside if you just want to like get your lunch and grab and sit somewhere. Just discuss what are some of your favorite parts of outdoor ed and what are some of the eco-friendly aspects you remember about outdoor ed. Okay, so that's it, and then you have like the full 35 minutes, or you have the 25 minutes after that to just do your own thing. So can you explain some of these things to me? Because I haven't been to wrapped up. Like 20 minutes. We're pretending like lunch was outdoor ed. <laughs> we talked about like the highlights of it, so maybe kind of even put you back in that kind of frame of mind, like you know, remembering outdoor ed, what it felt like to be there. Um, let me ask you, what were some of the so the second question that um, we put up on the slide? was what were um, some of the eco-friendly aspects that you remember about outdoor ed? So if you could share like a couple, like what are, what are, what are some of those eco-friendly things that you would, or the kids would experience that you experience at outdoor ed? Zero ort. Zero ort, I think I'm pronouncing yeah. that right. Or no yeah. food waste. No food waste. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and what do they do with the food? It gets tracked every week and they try to not take more than they're going to eat. And so the shared food can go back to the kitchen that's like not been on their plate. So each group with each uh, counselor, you know, cabin counselor tries to make sure that they're not just wasting food. So yeah, take Great. as much as you'll actually eat, not, not waste. How they, or they teach the kids how to organize the food and like what goes in what, what bin and why it goes in what bin. And, um, and they'll, they'll kind of like at the field, they'll do demonstration. Okay, this is, here's what goes in your green bin. Here's what goes in your white bin. And so the kids are trained to do that and they know how to do that. And I think that's great. There's a lot, there's a lot that's different about outdoor ed, about the, about the way they live their lives there. And they have to learn that really quickly to be successful in outdoor ed and to, to, to mesh with the lifestyle that, that they're learning about there. And then think about this. And then they come back to their school. Or, right, so now they're seeing systems that are completely different, and that's what six, uh, lesson six through ten is, is all about. It's reflecting on their experience in outdoor ed, thinking about the audits that they conducted before outdoor ed, and thinking about something that they learned in outdoor ed, where they can bring that back to their school and try to get others whether it's in their classroom, whether it's school-wide, students and teachers, to make some type of change. And like I said, if we're gonna look at the learning objectives, right? One of the objectives is they're going, students are going to think about the processes, the protocols, the infrastructure at Camp Jones Gulch, and how those are designed to solve problems, right? They have solar panels because they're trying to solve an energy problem. They have, um, short showers because they're trying to solve a water problem, right? Um, so thinking about those solutions that they find at Jones Gulch and comparing it to their, so the solutions or the lack of thereof at their school, right? Um, so, so the first thing that the teacher would do is, um, you know, because this is the first lesson back after outdoor ed, we're gonna, the teacher's gonna ask some questions about outdoor ed. Like, how was that experience for you? Um, so, Allison, like, do you think I could, I can, we could pretend like you're a student? I can be a student. Okay, great. So, what are some words to describe how you felt while you were at outdoor ed, Cap Jones Gulch, and what are some words to describe how you feel now that you're back at school? Um, I felt really happy and peaceful while I was at Camp Jones Gulch. And now that I'm back home, I feel a little sad, but also connected to my friends. Thanks. Um, what about what, what about what part of being at Outdoor Ed do you feel was most impactful for you? Mm, getting to be away from my parents for a week, and also getting to hang out with my friends. Um, and what about the what about the Outdoor Ed experience itself? Being there for the, uh, that whole week. Mm. Is there anything that stands out, like an experience that you really remember that, that like you still that'll take with you for a long time? Yeah, we saw a crab at the tide pool. That was really cool. Um, and my naturals picked it up. And also, um, we 
you got to see Big Red and Dead Fred. Awesome. Thank you. You're doing a good job. <laughs> um, and thinking back to Camp Jones Gulch or a time when you felt connected to nature and the environment, what was different about the experience than an, about that when you were there than just a normal day of school? Um, when we got to see Big Red, we laid on our backs and looked up at the trees, um, and I felt really small, um, and that was a really cool moment. And I don't really get to lay down and look up at the sky at, at normal school very often. That's true. That's a great experience. Yeah. So, you know, the teacher will obviously kind of riff off of the answers of the student and try to like, and, and all the students, right? And they're all going to share different experiences. We want to kind of encourage that kind of like, um, that connection that they felt at Outdoor Ed and have them start thinking about like, this is not where they are now in their classroom. It's a different experience than they were at Outdoor Ed. So, it should be that if there were things at Outdoor Ed that they found were valuable, that um, in their experience was powerful, then it's possible to bring some of that to school. It's not that we can only have this experience for four days or whatever, and for your entire K through 12 experience, right? Like if there's ways that we can help bring a little bit of that, of that back to school, and um, it'll make them feel powerful if they can do that, right? So the follow-up questions to that is really having them reflect on the audits and thinking about like what were the solutions at Outdoor Ed that respond to the problems that they kind of identified while they were at school. So there are, there are some questions there. The teacher will come up um, with his or, her own, or their own questions. So like for the energy one, thinking back to your energy audit, so there are groups in the class that did the energy audit. They can pull up the energy audit. They can pull up the the presentation that they did about what they learned and what was interesting, what was surprising, and thinking about like how was energy handled differently at Camp Jones Gulch than it is in our school. So they might say something about the solar panels, they might say something about the little signs that said don't forget to turn off the lights or whatever it is. And they'll do that similar thing for water, for waste, and for land. And they'll really start deeply reflecting on the differences between their school and outdoor ed for those four things, which they now have a lot of knowledge and experience with, right? Because they literally kind of like did an audit of their school. So they really are con like deeply connected to those concepts and saw things that were quite different um, during their experiences. So um, the teacher can define what does it mean to be a solutionary, um, watch the video about being a solutionary. There are some books there. Um, you have one, right? And then the teacher is going to introduce this idea of the design challenge. And the, 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 let me just say to you, the idea of the design challenge is the students are going to, so you could, figure, you could do it however you want in terms of the grouping of students. Like the kids that did the energy audit would focus on energy. The kids who did the water audit would do, focus on water. Or kids might want to mix it up. You know, like they're really passionate about something that they didn't do in their audit. And they're like, well, I did energy, but I really want to focus on finding a solution for water, right? And what the kids are going to do is they're going to do one of two campaigns. They're going to create the campaign. It's not incumbent upon them to actually implement the campaign in the school. That's up to the teacher. That's up to the principal. Depends. There's a lot of constraints for it. Is there, is there an amount of time for this? Um, there's a lot to think through this. But the design challenge itself will be for the students to design one of two types of campaigns. One is an advocacy campaign which is bringing a physical change to their school. Like what kind of a physical change could kids advocate for in their schools to make it a little bit more like outdoor ed? It could take some space that's not really being used. It's like a little bit of a weed patch and they could put some native plants in there. There you go. Physical change, exactly. Creating posters to remind like every room having like a please shut off the lights poster. So that we would consider for this, this is the behavioral change. So that's the second kind. So totally, like the fit, like the the posters would be there to what we'll call it. We call that an action campaign. So we're trying to create behavioral changes in the school. So for example, turn off the lights if there's nobody in the room. Uh, we're going to spend the next hour where you you and your group. So let's just say the people that you're literally sitting with are going to create either an advocacy campaign or an action campaign. We call it a school impact design challenge, okay? And this starts lesson seven. 
7, 8, and 9, we combine them together because this is really going to, like, the amount of time for each, um, for these three lessons is going to change depending on whatever the teacher wants to do, however the teacher wants to allocate that time. So I think it'd be great if you can open up that document. So we're in, on the website, lesson 789, and you'll see the second document there says School Impact Design Challenge. It'll force you to make a copy. Um, in the lesson plan, it's very specific about like, now you're at section one, step one, section three, step four, right? It's just like, it times everything out. Uh, but again, that's, it, there's flexibility built into that, so it's really about whatever the teacher wants to do. So the first thing that the teacher is going to do is to form groups. Um, and they're all centered around those four areas that were done for the audits. Energy, water, waste, and land use. Kids are going to sit together in those small groups. We prefer at no more than three. No more than three kids in a group. We found, that especially in, in science, like three is like max. Right? Um, the kids are going to list, so the kids get this document, by the way. Right? Um, they're going to list their names and they're going to choose their roles just for the first um, couple of steps. There's going to be one student who's the facilitator who's going to be asking the questions. There's going to be one kid who's going to be recording, so the recorder, and one of the children are going to be the auditor, which means they're going to be using the audit from before. So if, they're, if, they, if this group has chosen energy, let's say, that you're doing energy, then you'll pull up the energy audit that you've done. Or if you didn't do the energy audit, you, you did water before, and you're doing energy now, you're going to have to ask one of the other students for their energy audit, right? So they have the data that they're going to be able to use to support their campaign. Uh, and then they're going to uh, start reflecting specifically on that area. So if you're the energy group, then you're going to be thinking about the following questions, the facilitator would read the questions, the recorder would record the answers to the questions, and the auditor would have the audit, the audit ready to be able to use um, during the answering process. So here, it's in which ways is Camp Jones Gold similar to our school? Did anything surprise our group in terms of these similarities? If so, what? Did our group learn anything new? So you're talking about the similarities between Camp Jones Gulch and your school, then talking about the differences, right? And then they start brainstorming. Let's think about those things that we just learned about the similarities and differences, and we're just gonna talk about the differences now, because obviously our school is different than Camp Jones Gulch in some way, and they're gonna start thinking about um, what possible physical change could we bring to our school, or what type of behavioral change could we bring to our school. And they're gonna brainstorm, they would fill in these areas here about the different possibilities for both, you know, this is a lot, but it's all in the documents. So I'm just kind of moving through it. Um, and then they're going to make a decision. Like, what are the benefits of doing an advocacy campaign? What are the benefits of doing an action campaign? And which one do we want to do? And they're going to pick that campaign. They're going to say it right here, advocacy or action. They're going to describe it. Oh, we're, we want an action campaign for water conservation or for energy, like, you know, turning lights off, or for whatever it is, they'll title their campaign, and then they'll get working, okay? So that's what I'm going to ask you to do right now. You're going to go through this process, obviously, much more quickly than the kids would. I would love to see us do something that's simple, that is easy to implement. We do have some gardens. If you could all clear that person doesn't have to come back for our uh, we're going to do a little gallery walk. So, can you choose one person from your group to present? So, we chose land use because we both didn't really feel like we would choose that, so that's why we chose it. Um, and so, at my school, there are around the border, there's trees. It's not real good, they're not really used. These are um, mulberry trees all along here, and then these are eucalyptus all along here. And we were thinking about, um, could we create a trail, kind of like a nature trail, that kind of meandered along here and along all the way through to here. And then there's a grove, of a big grove of eucalyptus right here. And so could we 
um, have some kind of forested areas that are maybe more native trees. We do have some redwoods along here too that we could uh, utilize. And then have little pockets of outdoor classrooms that were really comfortable outdoor classrooms because a lot of times they're not so comfortable and so um, teachers don't use them. And so having some kind of located near the classrooms and then maybe one here in this grove where you would actually walk to. And then some different places in here because we want it to survive. So we're thinking of using a lot of natives because that would be great for supporting some of our wildlife. And then also doing things like maybe indigenous plants maybe some colonial, a colonial garden. Um, so kind of taking a look at the curriculum and what kinds of other things could we have little pockets of as you walk through here, but mostly um, natives and trees and that type of stuff. Are, is this um, an action plan for um, turning out the lights? And that's our prototype. We want to put posters up around the school as well as little cards, reminder cards that encourage people to remember to turn out the lights. Also possibly having um, a light monitor for each classroom so that there, it's the job of the students to be remembering to turn off the lights. We want to start with kids and hope that they'll teach the adults to be better consumers. Can we teach my son too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we came up with this idea, we're going to call it POTS, <laughs> and it's preserving outdoor transformational space. And it's an advocacy plan for our elementary school to um, create pots for every single um, classroom to fundraise for them. We make sure that they have, they're given um, a pot with enough soil that they can then as a class decide what they're going to plant and ask them to choose plants that are um, uh, companion plants like a native plant like marigolds or some other things more native to the environment to pair with a fruit or vegetable plant. So each um, grade level gets that experience of raising a companion plant, seeing how it grows and how it survives. Kind of uh, use this kind of unused space at our school and try to transform it into a greener space or a space that we could utilize. Uh, we really wanted to like go big. I mean, we wanted, we wanted a vegetable garden, but we were really inspired by the chicken coop. We wanted live animals. Uh, we realized it's a really big project to take on. And this is just kind of the prototype of what we would get to to try to get people on board with it. And then we would obviously have to um, convince uh, people higher up to give us the money to help us with that. And we'll need lots of volunteers and lots of time. But um, we thought that this was just a good start to kind of start the inspiration of what could be Dream Big. You never know what can happen. Okay. Thank you. There's a protocol within the lesson itself that the students would get feedback from other student groups and then go back and then um, incorporate that feedback into their prototypes and then have a final prototype which they would present. So there's a step that we didn't do here. So that was lesson seven, eight, nine. And now, give you Andrew back for lesson 10. Um, okay, so final reflections. So the last part here, I, I wrote up that this is the hero's journey because um, basically what you want your students to recognize is that they are solutionaries. Right? So you took them through this process where they were like the characters in the story, like learning about the basics and the fundamentals. They then learned about the problem. Then they went, got to go to Outdoor Ed where they learned about all these solutions. And then they were brought back to figure out like, well, how do we make this happen now in our community, right? So they are the main character of a story. And so it's, it's useful sometimes to have them reflect about that. Like, well, what do we actually do in each phase, right? And have them really think about their own learning journey that they were on, but also their own journey of being like a, a hero, a solutionary for their school. So you could do a reflection like that, where you take them through that kind of like process, or you can just do it like a regular type of reflection. Just like, here are some questions that I'd like for you guys to discuss and respond to. Like, what are your enduring understandings from this about sustainability or about the planet? Um, think back to the problems we explored before. To what extent did our solutions actually remedy those problems? So you could ask them to really think about that kind of thing. You could ask them to think about how is your understanding of like living things changed because of this? So basically, this one is just some examples of ways that you could reflect with students so that you had something to work with. And then that's kind of it, right? Like that, now you brought them through a full solutionary unit from fundamentals, problems, going to have that big experience looking at solutions, and then doing the solution themselves, and then wrapping it up with some reflection. 
um, I always recommend like that that's like kind of like a chance to do this assessment right a reflection can be an assessment and you can do this really creatively as well you could have kids do a video testimonial or an annotated illustration a top 10 things I learned from this experience right like it doesn't have to be like a traditional just like answer a question in a journal prompt it could be a lot more exciting and fun um, and then I, we also offer up some extension activities like um, you could have them read this book, Thank You Earth, and then write their own love letter to the planet, right? Like how did they shift in their own like stewardship and care for the planet by the end of it? So you could do fun things like that that'll really dip into your like common core literacy requirements and really get, you know, some grounding in, in writing as well as listening and speaking. They were nice. We are very grateful for your time today and for your willingness to pilot this curriculum. And we also want you to know, like, if you have any questions, you have any feedback, anything like that, like, we're here to support, right? And so, and we were just talking about how we'd like to, like, get involved and come and observe if that's useful or, like, you know, just, it's a pilot, right? So we want to, like, really get in there with you and, and be as helpful as possible. Don't feel good? Thank yeah. you. Thank you.